Hello YouTube, today we're going to discuss the fascinating topic of Indian lifting wisdom. But before we begin, I want to introduce the topic by the following quote. No citizen has a right to be an amateur in the matter of physical training. I'm sure it's a quote you've heard before because it's one of the most base things ever said in the entire history of humanity. And interestingly enough, every single civilization has that same understanding, meaning that they put strength and the ability of man to develop himself as the bedrock, as the foundation of their greatness. And this is something that China, for example, and India understood before anyone else. Because keep in mind that these are civilizations that existed way before European civilizations, way before, of course, North America and the superpower that it has become. Meaning that these are dynasties that you can go back thousands of years and find incredible things about them. Their history is rich and therefore there is a ton to learn about. It. We're going to do China another day. I cannot tackle China and India in the same video. It's impossible. We're going to focus entirely on India for today, which represents 2,500 years of history because Yes, if you go back 2,000 years, you can still find traces of physical education in the history of India. Back when in Europe, we were trying to figure out what the fuck was going on, there were no nations whatsoever, there was still, there was already a dynasty, an empire in India. And so that's what we're going to be discussing today. Sadly, most of the history of Baghdad has been lost because it was mostly based on oral tradition, meaning that these were things that were passed down from son, from father to son, etc., etc. A lot has been preserved, but what I'm going to present to you today is mostly my own interpretation. So, I apologize to any Indians watching this if I'm a little bit iffy on the time period, if I don't really know everything about the ethnies and the caste system. All of that I'm not super interested by. Mostly what I want to look at today is the lifting wisdom. And I can promise you that there is a ton of it because... Indian history is layered because, as I said, it's thousands of years old. So there are distinct periods and each period has its own load of wisdom that we can learn from. So what we're going to do is we're going to go right back to the beginning and we're going to move on to modern times. And we're going to see what we can learn from every single period because each one brought its own contribution. The first one we're going to talk about is the Vedic Age, which was apparently supposedly the first one. And back in those days, again 2,000 years ago, there was already a trace of physical education, meaning that the men would mostly ride horses and they would practice archery to prepare for war. But the thing that I found the most interesting in that fact, because at the end of the day, humans preparing to kill other humans is nothing new, was the distinct creation of a recreational activity linked with the fact and the, the ability in reality to develop one's skills. They were not just riding horses because it made them better in battle. They also did that because they understood that it strengthened them physically. And it's the same with archery. If you look at professional archers, yes, they have skinny arms, but they have very muscular arms at the same time. If you look back when bows were not so technologically advanced, the ability to pull back and draw back to be able to have power into the arrow took a shit ton of force. So you bet your ass that these guys had very strong back muscles and they had very strong arms. Which meant that back then, functional training wasn't just a meme. These guys actually trained for function, but they also managed to put the fun in function because we know that they did that also as a hobby just to have fun. So it was both a mean to exercise and also a tool of war. And this is where, by the way, a lot of the things that we do nowadays originated. Look at, for example, yoga. Yoga was invented back then. They had their means to keep the body strong, so the physical activity. And they also had their methods to meditate, meaning to reinforce the spirit, to be more spiritually inclined, to focus the mind, which they also made as challenging as possible on the body. The ancient type of yoga was extremely skewed towards positions that forced the body into very damaging compromised positions in truth, while the muscles had to put in a ton of work. It was actually very hard, it actually shaped the body, and more importantly, it balanced it. So just like that, you see that 2,000 years ago, 
people from the Vedic age of India already had figured out that there was a necessary balance between spirituality, the development of the mind, and the physical development, and that most of the time, these two intercrossed. It wasn't separated. And you had no one doing just one thing. No one just meditated. Everyone was doing both, because a complete human does both. Keep that in mind, because it's a very important theme in India. And if we're going to compare that to today, it's funny because I heard someone say it, and it immediately clicked. Weightlifting, in truth, is a form of yoga. It's a form of weighted yoga. When you do a squat, you get into a deep compromised position with weight on your back. What does it do? It stretches the muscles. In a sense, it also works on flexibility and mobility. And if we were to go even deeper, there is a spiritual aspect to lifting. I think that if you're on this channel, you also agree with me. The Church of Iron is named the Church of Iron for a reason. It's because we just, we're not just baboons lifting weights. There's also something in there that's pushing us forward. And that's something I think has been ingrained in us from a very long time ago, because our ancestors, whether you're Indian or not, our human brothers were also following the same path. It's important to remember that because if we were to look at the contributions of India now in the West, you would say, well, yeah, we have yoga, but look at yoga nowadays. It's something that's for white women for the most part, who are like 50 and they have three dogs and that's what they do on the weekends. That's not real yoga, that's not real spirituality, and it's not real, uh, real physicality. It's bullshit. Why? Because it's been westernized. It's a thing that it will also come back a ton. You will see that at the root, the Indian lifting wisdom was pure, and it has been corrupted by this modern age and by the fact that it has been made trendy. And anything that is be being made and adapted for normies immediately loses its sense. It's a warning and a message for weightlifting as well. We do not need to stoop down to the level of these people, because if we do, we're going to lose it, just like yoga lost itself. Now, after the Vedic Age followed the Epic Age, and this one is my favorite, and it's the one we have the most to learn about, because it was a, an age of war. Just like the Four Kingdoms in China we're going to discuss at some point also, it was an age where men were fighting other men. And when that occurs, you don't really have a choice, right? You're going to have a, phys a physical culture. You're going to have a culture where men are going to want to strengthen themselves because if you don't strengthen yourself, you die. So you don't have a choice. Nowadays, in a comfortable modern world, we don't have to prepare ourselves because we believe that tigers don't exist anymore and that wars are a thing of the past. Of course, it's a big mistake and all of the softies from Western countries are going to have a very rude awakening when they finally are pushed into the arms of battle because they will be completely unprepared. Back then, there was no such thing. Massive battles were everywhere. And this is the age that gave us the Mahabharata. I hope I pronounced that correctly. A book that I discovered and I was mind blown with how based it was. It's pretty much a catalog of all of the great things that humanity ever produced. It's full of battles, of wisdom, philosophy, integrity, great messages, there's muscles, there's buff dudes. What is there not to love? I'm actually preparing a special video that is going to introduce a brand new series on the channel based entirely on the Mahabharata, so you can look forward to that. Now, the book in particular, we're not going to get into too much, I don't want to spoil, but it was pretty much an epic. It's the Indian epic par excellence. And in that book was found all of the characteristics and the virtues and values that the epic age promoted. For example, the fact that Every single Indian was well prepared for the battles I described because their standardized education, not the specialized, but standardized education, included things like throwing javelins, sword fighting, club swinging, and wrestling. All things that, of course, are going to form a generation to combat, but most importantly, is going to train people and to make them look jacked. It's impossible to see what the people were looking like back then. I'm sure they weren't all bodybuilder-like, but you can bet your eyes that they all were in shape and fit. Because if you spend 50% of your time training the mind and 50% training the body, you're going to be complete in both cases. If you look at what you do, hopefully you're not in that category because you're on this channel, so you lift. But the average human nowadays in the modern world spends maybe 95% of the time training their mind, aka doing nothing and watching TV or Netflix, and 5% training their body while they go to spin class once a week. That doesn't count, it's bogus. Back then, the balance was there. The war was forcing humans to actually be physically active and really physically active. Like, sword fighting, 
you can bet that it's really tiring and club swinging. Club swinging that is still uh, very fashionable in a sense in India nowadays. You will see that this tradition of club swinging we're going to get back to is very linked to their religion. I wanted to include this idea of standardized education that included 50% of physical training because if you look at the people who taught back then, history teaches us that these were not specialized teachers either. And that's interesting because it means that the people who taught the scriptures, so the arts, the ability to write, to read, etc., were also the same teachers who taught physical activity. It's like if the guy who taught you philosophy in high school also taught you how to bodybuild. Of course, it's absolutely impossible nowadays. It's personally a dream of mine to be able to do both one day. But can you imagine how amazing it must have been and the type of men that you received education from? Because I firmly believe that to reach a higher level of spirituality, you have to have a high level of physicality. So back then, they had teachers who were muscular, fit, strong, and intelligent, aka the best teachers possible. In a sense, if we were to connect that to another civilization, you could say that the Greeks were that as well. Keep in mind that the Greek philosophers were for the most part jacked and buff. We discussed that in a previous video you can find in the description about Greek lifting wisdom. Well, Plato, for example, was nicknamed Plato because it meant white shoulders. The quote I cited at the, side, at the start of the video is attributed to Socrates, who said that to Diogenes because Diogenes was looking pale and skinny and Socrates was like, bro, do you even fucking lift? You're not going to be able to be a good philosopher if you don't have bulging biceps. So go to the gym right now. Same logic here. The teachers were also the ones teaching physical activity. And that is great because it promotes the idea of the complete man. Our Western civilization and humanity as a whole, and I'm going to make an entire video about it because it's a very interesting philosophical concept, is specialized. As humans, we are specialized, but we went too deep. Now we are hyper-specialized for cerebral activities and we are completely putting aside the physical activity, meaning that we created a generation of new humans that are like weird aliens, where they have puddings for muscles that can barely use their bodies. That is not the way. We lost our way. The way was always the complete man. And what is the complete man? Someone who is accomplished in terms of academical prowess, who is intelligent, who can, who can actually produce philosophy and concepts, and who is physically fit, the two at the same time. Just one and gonna cut it. And the guys back then understood that. 2000 years ago, they already knew where we were supposed to be. And sadly, we lost that path. So that meant that back then, while training was mostly for soldiers, because it was to prepare for war, it was also widespread. And that's when we go back to the swings, which was called, and is still called by the way, Gara swings. The gara is la masse, it's the hammer. It's the club that they would swing around the shoulders to reinforce the musculature of the upper body. It is still very present in modern Asia, actually. If you go to a wrestling gym, especially a pro wrestling gym in Japan, for example, you will see the guys doing gara swings. In some gym, gyms now, they will still do that. Actually, uh, in here, in this modern platform of YouTube Fitness, we have a guy, Chris Duffin, who create the, created the shoulder rock, which is pretty much a gala swing that he sells to you for 10 times the value. But uh, the Indians had that shit figured out 2000 years ago. So I don't know why we're trying to reinvent the wheel or in this situation, why we're trying to reinvent the club. It's already been perfected. It has been perfected. And it was actually a staple of training back then, meaning that there are legends of soldiers, of kings even, waking up in the morning and the first, first thing they did is step out of bed, Look at the sun and do a thousand gala swings, first thing in the morning, until they were drenched in sweat, then they jumped into a lake, and that's it. They started their days like this. Very similar to nights, actually. It's incredible how peculiar the connections between strong men are. Wherever you look, at whichever dynasty or time period, strong men always had the same habits. Physical activity, purity of mind, development of the spirit and the body, of course, and also cleansing afterwards. It was a tradition for the Gala Swing, and it's still something that is practical today. It was more practical back then, of course, because some soldiers fought with the swing. For the people who watch Berserk, Guts trained with his sword. He would put weights on his sword, he would swing his sword, and then he would swing it in battle. Indians were doing that shit. 
So the guy was training with his gara, he would swing it all the time, and then in battle, it would be the same club, but this time he would be aiming at enemy soldiers' heads. Can you imagine this? You have some Indian dude who's been doing tens of thousands of swings every day, and that now he's aiming that swing right at your temple. Imagine how terrifying that must be, and imagine how incredibly uh, effective that must be as well, because, again, if we're talking about functional training and carryover, that's a one-to-one -one carryover. The soldiers often use the weapon that they practice with on the battlefield. And it's actually said that the creator of the gara, the club, was Vishnu, a god, and that therefore it made the gara a sacred weapon, meaning that gara swings were a quasi-religious practice. They were not just swinging, swinging it empty-handed or empty-minded. Empty-handed would be a little bit complicated. For the most part, they were concentrating. And this is when we go back to the idea of meditation. I personally meditate when I lift. Lifting is my meditation. Because I don't think that meditation is something that you must necessarily do without moving. Actually, I believe that for some people, physically straining as you meditate is the best way. Because you tap into that deepest part of you, that calmest part of you. And the gala swing was such practice. It was, in a sense, a form of prayer. A prayer directly to Vishnu. And I think it's important we remember that because I think too much of what we do in the gym nowadays is based entirely on materialistic uh, desires. It's nice and it's good to live to look good. I do exactly that. I'm a bodybuilder. But don't let go of the spirituality. Because the spirituality is what is going to get you going back. It's what is going to keep that fire going. If you just rely on the surface and the external, at some point it's going to die out. So call back upon that spirituality. Maybe you can, if you lift, actually call upon a god. It's interesting to see that modern practices of strength, for example, also rely on that. If you look at the Icelandic strongmen, some of them, even though they're technically not praying the old gods anymore, still call upon the old gods of, I don't know, like Viking tradition, not necessarily because they believe in them, but because it fires them up. I think that this link between Vishnu and with other creators is important because you will see that it makes a comeback. Spirituality and the religion of Hinduism was a key component of that time period. Since this idea and this entire practice of Gala Swings being linked to Vishnu marks a tradition of Indian religions to be linked with strength and reverence to power. And this is something that this video made me realize because, of course, I did my research with my interpretation. And when I started looking into Hinduism, I was shocked because I only knew it from the outside and the perspective I had as a Westerner. And what I saw mostly was gods who are sometimes purple, sometimes blue, sometimes pink, very effeminate, doing some poses like this with like a dot and playing the flute. And I thought to myself, man, that's a very girly religion. I don't see how this could produce warriors. But then I looked into it. Yes, the gods might look a little bit girly from the outside, but when you look at their background, and when you look at the way they were portrayed back then, yeah, that's a completely different thing. Like, we're talking, we're talking a completely different interpretation of Hinduism, because the gods are all chads. If you look at what they do, we're not talking about the god of flower. There's no god of love and, and kisses and cuddles and puppies. Most of the time, it's like god of destruction, god of god, god of death or the god of protection, the god of strength, the god of devotion, all virtues and values that are extremely close to my heart and to yours, I hope, and linked to what I believe to be the ancient faith and the ancient religion that tended to create the strongest man. Again, just look at the Greek mythology and the Greek deities. Zeus was an asshole, but he was a very masculine asshole. The entire pantheon, even the females, were very masculine, they're very concurring in their behaviors. The same can be said with Hinduism, although I want to nuance and also say that it's not just about that. New, uh, Hinduism and also Greek, Greek mythology is also about the psychology of the gods. We're going to cover that right now. So we spoke about Vishnu, for example, and we spoke about what it meant. Now, when it comes, comes to the gods of Hinduism and the strength they represent, I want to cite, for example, Hanuman, who was the god of wrestling. And the people who wrestled, the wrestlers, of course, but also the people who lifted with the gala swings, would actually pray to Aluman before they would actually start their training regime. Again, direct connection to ancient Greece, where the people who train to participate in whatever competition, or even just to wrestle, or to strengthen the body, would pray to Hercules before. So in that case, Heracles, whatever you want to call him. 
It's interesting because this is the idea that I try to promote as much as possible. The idea of a male power fantasy. It's exactly what it is now. So Anuman, if we're going to discuss him for a second here, was a, a man monkey, in a sense. He was a creature that wasn't entirely human, who was said to be one of the strongest gods in existence. But he wasn't just the god of strength. He was also the god of devotion. And this is when the spirituality comes into play. It's not just about his physical capacities. It's also what it meant. I think that the men who prayed to Hanuman before wrestling weren't just doing that to pray for higher strength. They also prayed for higher devotion because the Maha... The Mahabharata, which is incredibly hard to pronounce for me, and Hinduism in general also insisted on inside values, not just external factors. So that tradition, I think, is important to point out because it's part of that Indian lifting wisdom. Now, if we're going to go back to the Mahabharata, in the Mahabharata, we have the history of India in a sense spoken from a perspective of both history and mythology. It's extremely common, and it's actually the case for every single religion and every single historical text. At some point, you don't really know what happened or didn't happen, and some of the characters start to take an almost mythical presence, like, for example, Solomon Suleiman in Islam, who was a king who existed, but also became a prophet and a saint. You don't know what... Ha you know he existed, but you don't know to what extent. You don't know if what he did is right, if it's actually something that we can take at face value. I say it doesn't matter. I say that what matters is the message. So if we look at the Mahabharata, it's mostly the history of the sons of gods who, through their feats of strength, through battle for the most part, became gods themselves. And there's a very important message in this because, just like with Hercules, for example, who had to go through several steps and the labors of Hercules, of course, to prove his worth, it's the exact same here. These guys were not born gods, they were born demigods. They had to prove their worth to be able to enter the pantheon, so the Indian pantheon, whatever name it is, if you want to tell me in the comments. So they had, they had, they had to prove their valor in battle. And I think that's what makes them such worthy examples. It's because they were not just gifted with strength right off the bat. They had to prove that they were worthy of respect. And so if you are a man and you are lifting, if you pray to one of them before you lift, what does it mean? It means that you want to be in their shoes. You want to be the exact same. You want to be put through the test and you want then to raise. You want to be able to transcend yourself, just like they transcended themselves in the Mahabharata. So now the people I'm going to be citing are, for example, Arjuna, the god of archery, Bema, the god of wrestling, and Ravana, the god of axe wielding. So again, as you see here, we're not talking about just making bouquets of flowers and knowing how to cook or bake a lot of bread. The god of axe wielding. What type of man do you think that religion in particular is going to create? Right? Again, keep in mind that the Mahabharata is deeply linked with Hinduism. In a sense, it's a formative text of Hinduism. It's not necessarily the same thing, but many of the figures of the Mahabharata are gods and, and divinities of of Hinduism. So again, history meets mythology, meets religion. It's the same every single time. I personally think it's great. It's just that it's very tough to navigate for someone like me when I see all of these names. But I don't need to worry about the names and you don't need to worry about it either. All you need to know is that Arjuna was able to apparently shoot a bird from 10,000 feet and he was able to pierce them through the eye. Okay. Bema was so strong he would wrestle mountains. And Ravana, the god of axe wielding, would cut down an entire forest to train. That's all in the Mahabharata. Now you understand why I want to make a video about the book. Because it's like, these are like Baki, they're like Baki characters. It's, it's Grapple Baki all over again. And actually, a lot of the stories that you read from mangas come from that. It's inspired from the Mahabharata. It's inspired from ancient Chinese stories of Sun Wukong, for example. It all has the same source. Because at the end of the day, all sorts and forms of male power fantasies come from the same belly. And that belly is this. It's the essence of power and the reverence for strength. So these, this is the pantheon of India that I just described. And as I said, these deities function as male power fantasies for the citizens who wish to get closer to them and resemble gods. It's like a manual. It's a manual on how to be a man, how to be a fantasized version of a man because you will never be able to achieve these feats, but you should aim to. That is the point. 
we're trying to get you to aim for Jupiter that you can land in the stars. So I actually encourage you to research the Mahabharata, but at some point, as I said, I will make a video. Now, these gods I just described, these demigods turned gods, are characters from that same book, and they served as epic models, a trope that we find in every single civilization that produces strongmen. Male power fantasies are a staple of the history, the literary history of every single civilization that produces men worthy of their sort, worthy to be actually spoken about. Look at the Vikings, look at their tradition. What did they have in their tradition? Gods that were jacked and strong. There is no mistaking it. It's what produces strong men. It's the ability to look at these role models and try to replicate them. If these role models are gone, like it is the case, for example, for Western civilization, for modern Western civilization, you end up with weak men. And that also verifies itself times and times again. Or you end up worshipping celebrities that are for the most part mediocre. You worship a raper, you worship a movie actor, and you end up with shitty role models because these people are human toads. And it's the case with all of these people who worship Hollywood celebrities. Compare Hollywood celebrities who play like superheroes and actual mythological figures, actual deities. Tell me which one is worthy of actually following. The guy who did Juice and ruined it for six months just to get his paycheck and play a fucking shitty movie about Thor or Thor. Which one do you pick? I think the answer is very simple. Go back to the source. I say that because the source in this case for Indians and for us in general is this text. It's the Mahabharata. But it's important to warn people of this because if you don't pay attention and your role models and your male power fantasies get dashed, you end up with wimp culture. Case in point, France. France, the wimpiest country in the world, and I don't want to hear anyone say anything about that. It's true. Men in France cannot be called men anymore. Why? We don't have role models. If you try to invoke like Napoleon, if you try to invoke anyone who had balls, even just Charles de Gaulle, you will immediately be shut down and you'll be like, someone was going to tell you, oh no, they, they were mean. They were mean. These are not good role models. Well, men in the Mahabharata weren't particularly nice, but they were getting the job done. And that's what we need nowadays. So if you want to make sure that you don't fall for wimp culture, like we did, sadly, you have to hold, hold on strong. Hold on strong to these male power fantasies. I say that because I took a look at India and sadly, you are not on the right path. You are becoming westernized by the day and therefore you are heading our way. You are going to end up like us. It's already on the way. I went to India. I looked at your men. Your men are not manly anymore. You are lacking that essence and that vitality. And I think it's because you are becoming moderns and you're going to join us in the grand reunion, the family reunion of wimps. And it's not something that you actually want. So please pay attention and be careful. If you're Indian and you're watching this video, for example, avoid your fitness culture and the fitness YouTubers that you have or influencers like the plague, because for the most part, they are playing the same role that, that Hollywood and all of these mediocre role models played for us. They are replacing something that used to be great. And actually, we don't have to look very far because you have your own Hollywood, you have Bollywood. Look at Bollywood, look at all of these actors that portray your gods and portray your great heroes of the past. They are all on roids, they are all fucking idiots. I listened to some podcasts by some Indians who had millions of subscribers and I heard some of the dumbest shit I've ever heard in my life. These are the people that are guiding your youth. What do you think is going to happen? You're going to end up with a generation of idiots and people who are going to be small or worse than that, people on drugs. India is dealing with a story crisis right now. It's actually in the top three country of places where people are doing steroids without actually looking at what it does with South Korea and Brazil. You know what this means? This means you're going to have hundreds of thousands of young men who are going to die very young. who are going to have health complications in their 30s or 40s because they're just not paying attention and are taking advice from the wrong people. They're taking advice from Bollywood heroes and actors who are on TRT in their 30s and 40s because they also don't know better or because they have the money to afford the healthcare. But the average Indian doesn't. The solution is simple. Go back to the role models of the past. The Mahabharata is an excellent guide. If you can actually go back to these male power fantasies, I think you will be fine. But please, please don't follow our example. I think it is a shame considering the great history that India has. You have so much to draw from that you really don't need to copy us, especially that if you pay attention, you will realize that 
we're not doing good. And by we, I say the West, France especially. Now, I say that to say, don't forget your history that goes for anyone and learn from your ancestors. That is the key. The Mahabharata is a mix of mythology and philosophy. And this is the perfect thing to draw from because in a sense, it's a Bible of strength. Just like the Greek texts of old are a Bible of strength. Now, we're going to take some time quickly to discuss two stories of the Mahabharata that I want to impose upon you. I want them to actually make a, I want them to actually give you a taste for it so that you understand what I'm talking about. Because as I said, it's not just about physicality. It's not just about big muscles. We are more than that. It's also mythology and philosophy. So the first story I want to talk about is the story of Eclavia and Dronacaria. Eclavia was a tribal boy who wanted to become a master archer. But he got refused as a student by Drona, I'm just going to call him Drona, who was himself a master archer because he wasn't a Brahmin, so he wasn't high enough in the caste system. But undeterred, he practiced day and night in front of a statue of Drona, the man that refused to become his teacher, and eventually he became so good at it that Arjun, the god of archery, became jealous of his talents. And so he sent Drona who was aiming to appease his god to see the boy. And what Drona did is that he went up to the boy and he asked him to sacrifice his thumb so that he would become his teacher as a proof of devotion. And Eclavia, without even thinking twice, did it. He cut, off his, he cut off his thumb. And that is a message, it's a lesson of devotion and a sense of sacrifice. Of the boy who achieved what he wanted but out of devotion and respect, was willing to sacrifice it all for the person he considered his master. Now, as you come to understand, there is, there is great cruelty in this tale. Drona is not a good person, and Arjun is not a good person either. But that's the point. I think that the good thing about male power fantasies coming from Indian tradition, Greek tradition, is that the gods were not perfect because they were not moral. It was the pre-moral epoch. We did epic, I think it's pronounced epic. We did not want the gods to be moral because we didn't want humans to be moral either, or at least not the morality we have espoused nowadays. The thing is that with our modern eye, you would look at this and say, well, they are assholes, I don't want to be like this. But you're missing the point. The point is that here in this situation, Eclavia is noble. Even though he was born a Brahmin, his soul was noble, he had nobility, he had a sense of sacrifice. It also teaches a message of acceptance of one's own fate, that everyone has its place in the universe. You can fight against it if you wish, or you can accept it. In the, in the case of Eclavia, he accepted it altogether. You can also question the feelings of Drona after he saw that. What did he think about the boy when the boy sacrificed his thumb? Didn't he think, oh, I was lower than him to start with because his heart was pure? It's a valid interpretation. I wanted to tell you that story because it is, in a sense, a psychological tale. One that shows that these heroes and these parables were also greatly focused on philosophy and on the ability to paint humans and the virtues one is to espouse. Now, if we're going to transcend that and go back to the muscle, we can also talk about Lord Krishna. If we're going to make a ranking of no power fantasies, Lord Krishna is top three. Because if you look at the description of the guy, he was said to have killed demons with his bare fists when he was an infant. So when he was that high, he was attacked by demons and he was like, all right, come on, I'm going to fuck you up. And he killed them all. Okay, great. After that, he was also said to be able to lift mountains with his finger and hold them for seven days. And to go back to a guy we actually mentioned previously, he defeated Hanuman in wrestling even though Hanuman was said to be one of the strongest gods and was not even entirely human. He was the representation of devotion and had impossibly advanced strength. All of that in one man. Again, it's a fucking Baki grappler character. It's a, it's a fucking Baki the grappler character, right? And actually, I'm thinking that if we were to encourage the author of Grappler Baki to rewrite the Mahabharata, but as a manga, it would be a hit. Like, it would be a hit. Imagine all of these gods written and drawn by Itagaki. It would be amazing. It's something to think about because it could actually bring back that type of male power fantasies to the forefront where they actually belong. Now, the thing with, the, with Lord Krishna, with that, the, that strongest of the god who is, again, to this day, adored by Indians and by Hinduism, 
is the fact that if you look at statues of him nowadays again, most statues of Krishna is a blue guy with six arms who's playing the flute. It's not very inspiring. But if you go back to ancient times, to these, to these, uh, to these times of war, to the epic age, th that wasn't the case. Actually, there was a, a big transvaluation of the representation of divinity. Back then, all of the divinities were described as jacks. And if you look at statues, I found one statue that's actually in Cleveland of Krishna and is represented as a very big man with a round face, massive arms and a round chest. Now, he wasn't quite a bodybuilder, but you will come to see and understand that the, the essence of bodybuilding and of physical development to that level was always present in the Indian, Indian people, and therefore it's no surprise that it manifested hundreds, thousands of years afterwards. Now we have to talk about a dark period and a quote-unquote dark age for physical development in India, where the lifting wisdom almost died, and that is the historical age of India which was characterized by a revolt against social disparities and therefore also a discontentment against Hinduism because Hinduism taught people they all had a role to play. Just like in the story of Eclavia and Kronakwarya, where Eclavia accepted the fact that he was lowest caste and just went with the flow. That, of course, is a message of acceptance, of self-sacrifice, but it's not one that people who are low caste are going to accept. So when they start to outnumber the people who are high caste, of course, this happens. If you watched my video about Nietzsche, all of that you are very familiar with. And it's very, it's very strange because, again, synchronicity throughout history and throughout cultures is almost mind-blowing. Meaning that what happened to Hinduism in India and the transformation it underwent also happened in Europe. It happened with the ancient faith, the ancient religion of the Old Testament, and Christianity. And it's the same transformation, where people were starting to revolt against the world, they were starting to revolt against the idea they had to accept their lot in life, they wanted more, they didn't want to be oppressed, etc., etc. It's the same path. And in India, the transformation was mostly because Buddhism was starting to interject itself in between Indians and Hinduism. And that new virtue that was actually injected into the mindset of these people interfered with the virtuous morality of Hinduism that was trying to again teach people, via the Mahabharata for example, all of these messages that were almost stoic messages of acceptance and sacrifice because Buddhism preached a more peaceful way of life. And when you start shifting your morality from master morality to slave morality, again to, to quote Nietzsche, you end up in a country and a place that has no role for warriors left. So, Warriors disappear. Is it any wonder that physical development in India died down at this point? Is it any wonder that that masculine virtue started to, in a sense, lose ground? I think that it's no mistake. Again, very similar to what happened to Europe with the knights. They were starting to become civilized by, by Christianity, but at some point, Christianity went too far and civilized them to the point that they stopped being knights and at some point also stopped being men. If you're interested by that, again, check out the Nietzsche series. Check out the video in the description about medieval lifting wisdom. Now, if we're going to go back to lifting wisdom in particular, this means that this shift in culture and in morality led to less explosive methods of training the body becoming more popular amongst people. So all of these swinging of the gala, all of these activities that resemble modern resistance training were pushed aside because, again, they were seen as coming from Hinduism and therefore not adapted to the role that they wanted humans to espouse. In that place came practices like pranayama or surya namaskar, that are types of yoga from what I understand. Pranayama is a form of breathing in and out, so it's a form of meditation. Pranayama uh, and surya namaskar is a form of yoga as well that's less intensive. And it's very interesting also because it also reminds me of what Krishnaya did. The medieval age, at least in Europe, was marked by a very strong accent on physical activity. But with la Renaissance and les Lumières, as we call them, enlightenment, talk about enlightenment, people more and more moved towards being pure spirits. They were pushing away the physical and therefore they were starting to also stop paying attention to their body. Physical development was not as important. It's exactly what happened in India as well, where practices like walking were considered atonic, meaning that it was seen as something bad for you. You were not to walk. 
So you were especially not to swing a gara because it was too dynamic, too explosive. It was not going to help you become a pure spirit. You were investing too many of your points into the physicality and therefore you were losing the path. The path of what? The path of enlightenment. See how everything is connected? It truly is beautiful. Now, after this quote-unquote dark age for physical development came the Muslim period, which marked a rebirth of physical activity because and I also covered that, of course, it's in the description. Islam puts a very strong accent on physical activity, on the development of the body. The body was gifted to you by the Creator. You, have, you are to sculpt it. It is precious. You are to bring it as close as possible to your Creator. And because the Creator is unique and perfect, it also means that your development is going to be infinite and needs to be very rigid and disciplined. So, Indians started to pick up physical development again. But keep in mind that with all of that, there was always an underlying current of lifting wisdom. It never died in India because when you come from a people, from a race, I'm not afraid of the word, from a race of people who fought, who trained for thousands of years, it's in your blood. I don't give a fuck what history does. I don't care about what type of moral interjection or transvaluation occurs. It is still there. It's still underneath the surface. It is just waiting for you to be able to actually express itself for you to push away the poison and to embrace once and for all the ways of the ancestors. So, after that Muslim period, which was a rebirth, came the British period and the imperialism of the Brits and their colonization, which of course, coming from a Frenchman, is comedic because we did it just as much as them, if not more. That's a discussion for another time if you want my opinion on colonization. In that case, which also led to another dark age because the Brits did not care at all about physical education for the Indians. They only cared if the Indians were going to pick up their sports like cricket. But for the most part, bodybuilding, like as a practice, almost died down. But then there was a rebirth. Because of course, when the flyer dies, it also always blooms again one day. So in the 1920s, we had what can be considered the start of modern bodybuilding in India with people like Ghosh and Sen Gupta who you can actually look up if you want. They wrote a great book about bodybuilding, how to train the muscle, how to pose. And I especially encourage you to take a look at the pictures of the guy who followed the methods. All Indians from the, from the 20, no steroids, pure blood Indians. Look at the way they look. Jacked, big, striations, all the wazoo, massive fucking biceps. They look tremendous. They look like they're straight from the Mahabharata. They look like they my gods. And that's why I said, you show and you must not despair the ability of your body to develop musculology, to be masculine and to call back upon these inspirations is in you. Again, you just have to be able to summon it once more because if you are Indian, but also if you are from any part of the world, you are the result of a rich history. That history is just waiting for you to be able to actually express itself through your muscles, through your values, through your virtues. And that is something I want to impress upon you in this series that I'm going to continue, I'm going to talk about other types of lifting wisdom from all over the world or just getting started. Thank you for watching. Have an excellent night.